Welcome to We Plus You, straight talk about conscious business collaborations. And I am real excited today because it has been a while since I've had a conversation with Corey Jenke. So welcome back, Corey. It has been, a, I'm telling you, it's been a long while. So I'm really excited about tonight. Oh, me too, me too. It's been a long while, but it's amazing how when you got all your irons in the fire, how fast time goes. It does. So why don't you start this conversation because you just wrote a great blog post about removing the roadblocks, if you will. And you can actually tell us the exact title. I just like, I actually like that piece about removing the roadblocks. So that just stuck in my mind right now. <laughs> okay, great. Well, it's called the communication superhighway. You know, in our generation, in the modern world, we're always talking about the information superhighway. And that, that's sort of interesting because people have information thrown at them at 100 million miles an hour all day, every day, and yet we're supposed to communicate and connect on a level that actually gets something done. And so what happened that precipitated this post is I was working in the middle of the pharmacy. And it's kind of funny because, you know, I'm doing my thing at the pharmacist, checking and, and counting and, and working on the computer. But simultaneously, I hear all these conversations going on. And, you know, I've got somebody at the drop-off and I've got somebody at the cash register. And what I think is fascinating is that once in a while I can hear something happen and I just close my eyes and go, no, you didn't just say that. So in this case, one of our clerks got real defensive over something the customer said and goes into this scenario to protect her ego, in which case the customer, I said in the blog and, and in the way I really saw it, the customer sort of opened her mouth and swallowed my clerk whole. And so my clerk, you know, basically runs away in tears. So I run down there take care of the customer, get her all smoothed over and, and, and clear the line. And now, of course, I've got to do damage control and, of course, collect, uh, correction for the next time. And so when my clerk asked me, her name is Julie, I said, Julie says, well, you know, what did I say? You know, and, and I don't believe for a minute that we should ever just blame the customer. And, oh, yeah, the customer was out of line and don't, don't worry, shake it off. Because what that does is it sets them up for a future failure, right? I mean, if... if if we don't help them see why the situation went kitty wampus, they're never going to do better the next time. So I said, imagine if you will, if you closed your eyes and imagine between you and me right now, Carly, there is a highway running right between us. And then close your eyes and think about all of the, the road construction signs and the detour blocks and the twists and turns and so forth that can be between us in that communication superhighway, if you will. And I said, our job is to accept 100% responsibility for any relationship and realize that our job is to remove as many of the roadblocks as we can because the clearer the road, the smoother the ride. So approach the block from that way. And what happened is that people have commented already that, wow, you know, I didn't think about a conversation. We've always heard the word two-way street. But they didn't really realize that, yeah, you know, you've got communication difficulties based on things like whatever happened to the two of you before today's interaction. This lady had a screaming kid in her cart, and I'm sure she was annoyed by that. And then, of course, we all bring expectations into any conversation. So it really sets us up to either fail miserably or succeed wonderfully if we become experts on clearing our own communication superhighway, if you will. What do you think about stuff like that? Exactly. So that's why for me what stood out was clearing the roadblocks. And we forget that we all have stuff when we come to the table. And everybody, I don't care who it is, when we come to the customer customer service counter, if you will, we like you said, she had the baby screaming in the cart. And God knows what she was going for even before that. What did she wake up with? When she woke up and put her foot on the floor... Was she in a happy mood? Was she in a sad mood? You know, what, what was on her table? I mean, what was literally, what did she have for breakfast? Did she have a fight with her husband? You know, did she have enough money for that week? I mean, you know, we don't even know what her circumstances are. Is she, you know, is she on SSI? Is she on SSC? Is she on welfare? We have no idea what that woman is actually going through. And we don't consider when we meet people what their circumstances are. And we need to remember that no matter who we're meeting, that no matter what their circumstances are, we need to understand that 
we need to think of walking in a mile in somebody else's shoes. So we don't need to jump on someone right away. Just literally step back and realize that we have no idea what was going through their mind in that moment before they approached us. Is it right that they screamed at, screamed at us? Not necessarily. However, is it right for us to scream back at them? Not necessarily. So we need to actually just step back and just listen to them. And sometimes you'd be surprised that that very the way we treat them could actually set up their day in a completely different way. If we're actually nice to them, we could actually defuse whatever's going on for them. Our smile, when we if they're in a really irate mood, just us smiling at them could actually diffuse it a little bit. How we actually speak back to them, our tone could diffuse it a little bit for them. And you know, we've had many conversations about body language, tonality, all these things make a huge difference. Oh, I agree. And, and I think oftentimes people are walking around expecting a fight or expecting difficulty. You walk into a place and it seems like, you know, there are all these barriers, physical barriers, um, you know, line cues and signs. One of the things that really gets me is when you walk into a place and there's all these signs that are speaking to you in a way that you don't necessarily want to be spoke to. You know, it is not our fault if you lose all your stuff. It is not our fault if this. You have to sign off on that. Well, look what I had to check a box that says basically I won't sue Google if something happens when they record me just to get on this program. So I think one of the things that we have to realize is that the environment that we set up really can set a negative tone without us even realizing that it does. And so often the way we stand, the tone of voice we use, can indicate to that person whether or not we are a friendly face or a not so friendly face. And I think it's hard because in our modern world so many people are afraid to take responsibility for the customer, responsibility for the relationship, that it does seem like you have to struggle often just to get somebody to hear you, let alone listen to you. And so we have to realize that when a customer comes to us, whether that be a spouse, a child, a coworker, or someone who actually gives us money, that they're not sure what they're going to get until they get into the relationship. So as soon as we show them a, a voice of resistance, right away they're going to get defensive. So we have to really take ownership and show them that we have indeed cleared that path and, and showing them that we are about helping them. I want to point something else out too. It was very fascinating. I actually had to go get something at the DMV the other day. And it's what they don't, when we are also in a, uh, what do you call it, a negative mood, us as the customer, it also triggers something in us to be more negative. It's like if you go up to the teller and they have a smile on their face, we're going to be friendlier because they have a smile on their face and they're treating us with a certain tone. So it's, it's very interesting that if you're nice, the, your customer is going to be nicer. And we forget that sometimes. It's like if you're in a foul mood, your customers could be in a fouler mood. So it behooves us to be nice. If we're on, you know, so if we're on the customer side, if you want a customer to be nicer to you, it behooves you to be nicer. In the same tone as the customer, if you want the person on the other side nicer, it behooves us to be nice as the customer. And I think we both forget that on both sides. It's like it's really funny how it's, it, it works. The nicer we are, the nicer they are. And it back and forth it goes. And so I was at DMV the other day and this, this person really was a really negative nilly. And it was really funny. It was it was really starting to affect me. And I'm going, Well, wait, wait a minute. I don't need to be, you know, so I'm like, Whoa, this person's really having a bad day, you know? And I was actually in another place and this lady really did have a negative and I finally just went in my in my bag and I pulled out a pay for a bracelet. I just handed it to her. I go, you know, thank you very much. And I handed her bracelet. She was like, like, what's this? I'm like, just have a really nice day, pay it forward type of thing. You know, so it's just trying to shift her out of her out of her mindset because she was just in such a she was a sourpuss, you know? And it was just really funny. It was just like, I don't I don't really need to have your negative energy with me, but you know, here, have a nice day, you know? And I'll do that. I find myself doing that a lot now. When someone's in a really yucky mood, I'll just usually take a smile card out of my purse or a pay it forward bracelet and I'll just put it up, you know, give it to them. And now the funny part is sometimes it really will shift them in that moment and they'll immediately start to smile and they'll go, what is this? And I go, 
and then they'll, they'll look at me kind of quizzically, and then they'll start to smile. I go, hey, it worked. You're smiling, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, right? Or, you know, so either, and sometimes, sometimes I tell people, carry tools with you. Carry a smile card. Create, hand make smile cards. You don't have to go buy smile cards. You can hand make smile cards with crayons for Pete's sakes, you know, be creative, do something out of the box. You don't have to go buy, pay it for, you know, bracelets. Just make something. And whatever you want to do, get creative. And when you see people like that and they're you're, they're making you kind of down in a nilly mood, then take something you've created and just hand them something. And you might get a giggle out of them or like, what's this type of thing? But you know what? It'll shift them. So I mean there are there are always ways to be creative and out of the box to help shift other people too. And that's what I've been doing lately. And I tell you what, it, it takes me out of their space because I don't want to be in their negative space. And look, I'm human. I've had my meltdowns. I mean, we all have. It's just just being aware of the fact that we can let other people trigger us and being aware of our own meltdowns and going, okay, that wasn't really great to do, you know, just and then catch yourself. And again, not beating yourself up either because that's not going to help. When you've had a meltdown, recognize it. Don't beat yourself up for it and go, okay, that wasn't a good thing to do. Because beating yourself up is not going to help. It's done. It's over. Next. Move on. To, you know, Next minute is a new minute. Well, you know, that's very well said. There's a couple of, in, of thoughts that I, that I have. You know, I just recently read The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And what I find fascinating is that every time you read a book, you're in a different spot when you read it. And so there were some things that were really, really standing out to me that, that didn't necessarily stand out quite as much the time before. And one of those is that space between stimulus and response. So what Stephen Covey said was, look, you can't control anything that happens to you, but you can control everything that comes out of you. So there's this space between stimulus and response. Whatever happens to you, whatever space that other person's coming from, your response is totally under your control. And the people that do better in this world are the people that stretch that space to a larger space and use it more constructively. And as you said, when you walk into somebody's environment, you have a choice. You can either accept their tone or you can bring them to yours. So whose tone are you accepting? I, I like the way Sidney Portier said it was when you go for a walk with someone, Something happens. It's unspoken. Either you adjust your pace to their pace or they adjust your, their pace to yours. So whose pace are you adjusting to? The other thing in the book that I thought was interesting is the whole concept of seeking first to understand and then to be understood. And one of the things that happens is that most of us listen with the intent to reply rather than with the intent to understand. and I think the reason that that happens is our own ego is just pulsating. It just wants out so bad. But one of the things that I've learned over the years is most people don't really care to hear your autobiography, at least until you've listened to theirs. So the more we can share with them that we understand how they're feeling and we're willing to ask enough questions, like you said, to find out the better we are going to do it. And, and as I was reading that book, I was kind of telling you how I was walking through this forest preserve with my wife and son, and there's all these rivers and everything, but all three of us had a unique, different agenda that we all wanted to talk about. And I thought it was interesting because it was a quiet enough space that I could really understand that, you know, my wife was not really interested in hearing about what I wanted to talk about because she's got a marathon coming up and her hip flexor was all out of whack and my son was having his birthday which was yesterday but at the time he was having a birthday in a week and he could turn any word into a story about the Legos that he wanted to get for his birthday. I mean you've heard of the human joke machine my son was a human Lego machine and so I really just you know put this this agenda that I had and just put it aside and listen about the hip flexor for my wife and we talked about the guy that she had seen in physical therapy a few years ago and things like that. And, and then she was much more receptive to the problems that I was having. And, of course, my 10-year-old, who is now 11, we weren't ever going to get him off of Legos, but we did give him that chance. 
Now, the other thing about about being a customer that, that I just wanted to briefly mention is that it's really funny to me, having been in customer service since I was nine years old, how many people think that the way to get good service is to demand it? And I think the way to get good service is to be nice. You mentioned being creative, and I love that, but you know what? You don't even have to be creative. You just have to use the words please, thank you, and make eye contact and tell them what a good job they're doing. And you'd be just amazed at how quickly they want to hover around. Let's say it's a waitress. They want to hover around your table. And I find it fascinating because customers will come into my pharmacy and demand good service. And fine, I'll give you the service you're looking for, but I won't give you the service you deserve. And the differentiation might be that I might know of a way that could save you a lot of money, but if you're not going to be nice, if you're not going to be polite, I'm not going to want to work that hard to help you. Well, I was talking about when I was talking about being creative and out of the box. I was talking about from my point of view when I get when I get a customer service person who's mean. When I'm that's what I'm talking about. I agree with you. I always say thank you. I always say please. I always say you know. I always come off you know. I'm always very nice. I'm talking about when a person on the other side is being mean to me. I'm talking about being creative and giving them stuff to shift them. Oh, I <laughs> so agree. I carry stuff in my purse. So I carry stuff in my purse. So when they're when I get the meanies. I give them stuff to help shift them. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and I agree that, that that that's a really fun approach. But I mean, I think the average person, you know, doesn't even know about words like please or thank you. I agree. And, and I think that that's really really fascinating. You know, it's kind of interesting. If you ever go, have you ever gone on vacation, or gone away for the weekend, and you had to eat out two or three, four times in a row? And two, three, four times in a row, a waitress will say, boy, it's been a pleasure waiting on you because you guys are so nice. You've probably had that. Oh, yeah. And, and it's weird that you can stand out just by being polite. And that's, when I, that's when I'll leave the smile cards with the tip. I love leaving those <laughs> smile cards and saying thank you so much because you've been really wonderful. It's, just, it's amazing. Um, yeah, it, it truly is. I love doing things like that for people that are amazing. You know what's fascinating is if you ask to talk to a manager at a place, the manager always walks up and they're like, oh, God, what now? And then you say, you know, I just really wanted to tell you that Carly was my waitress and she was just awesome. And they're like, they're like this. So it so happens so infrequently that just compliments are, are rare. And, th and that's something for us as leaders to understand that when you are dealing with people who work for you or that you're trying to inspire or motivate, they're a little bit beaten around the edges. They're a little bit uh, dinged up. And as Les Brown talks about, he said that he read a poem by Maya Angelou that said that most people get banged up and then they pull off the highway of life and park. I mean, That's they, why I love Foursquare now. That's what I've been really doing on Foursquare now. You know Foursquare, the app where you check in where you're at? I've been really conscientious about leaving good tips about employees. So I've been, if I've been at a store where they've had, I've had really good customer service, I'll actually write something and tweet it out. And I've actually gotten tweets back from the companies now saying, thank you so much for letting us know about this employee at, at this particular store. And they've actually tweeted me back and saying, what store, at what location did you go to? Oh, how cool. So I've really been using the app now when I've gone to different locations. Like I've actually got tweets back from Bed Bath and Be Bad Bath and Beyond now saying to me, "What location did you go to?" Because I go to Thousand Oaks all the time in California, and I go to this one particular store because the customer service there is so it's just really amazing. And there's certain stores now that I go to because the customer service is really good, and they always tweet me back and they're saying, "Thank you so much for checking in again." Because you know, it's like they actually have they actually now have social media people checking for people complaining. Because people now in Foursquare, when there is bad customer service, they'll tweet, "I've had really bad customer service at this place." And so now they have whole departments. That's all they're doing is checking for tweets for bad customer service. Well, like at the same time, you can now put in there, "I've had really good good waitress service, really good food." So you can check where where you know really good food is. They have really good whatever, burritos, whatever it is. So I'm really conscientious now of saying, hey, this person's got they got really good waitresses here, they have really good food here. And I really love it because you can now really check to see where you have really good customer service. Well, you know, and, and that's something too that, you know, 
when you think in terms of the opportunity that that gives us now as business people in that when you're able to just wow a customer with service you have the ability to have somebody like yourself advertise for you and, and you know it, it's it's fascinating because it's easier now to stand out than it ever has been before and so when you're a customer service person, if you realize that, you know, the whole world literally is watching because of apps like Foursquare, and I know there's a, a bunch of others, you have the ability to stand out in front of the whole world. Isn't that exciting? It is. And that's the thing. And that's why I don't think people realize the value of social media. I mean, social media is an amazing tool for things like that. I mean, you know, with, with the iPhones and other phones now where you can just actually say, you know, uh, I'm looking for this and it'll actually then put up a map and tell you exactly where it is and then it'll ask you, you know, it'll give you even directions as to where you want to go. I mean, social media and the, with the new technology of, of phones, you can find anything, whatever type of food you want, you can find anything you need and want now you can find. I mean, it's just brilliant. And so I just think people undervalue how social media can help your business. I mean, and, it, and it's just fabulous and especially Twitter now too because Twitter in the moment, you can just tweet out, "Hey, this is amazing. Go here." And, and so, you know, Facebook has its own. You, there's different tools for different things. You know, Facebook is more of an interactive social family, if you will, in a lot of ways. But Twitter is where, you, where is where you really do tweet things in the moment, just for specific things. This is very. It, they're apples and oranges. Twitter and Facebook, and Google's a whole another animal too. But anyways, I mean. I think everybody needs to understand how valuable social media is for getting your blog post out, get for anything, for getting your blog post out, for getting tips and tools out, for getting again your business out, getting clients. I you know, I've gotten so many clients through social media. Referrals. Referrals, you can get so many referrals through social media. I mean, I met you through social media. I mean, social media is such a valuable tool these days. Oh, for sure, but one of the things we have to really keep in mind as business people is that I imagine the same rules as apply to face-to-face -to -face communication such that each person who is really, really happy with your business is likely to tell four people, but each person who's really, really unhappy with your business is likely to tell 12. So if you, get somebody, you get somebody really fired up on social media against you, you have really, really hurt your chances to succeed in business. So I think that that we have to be even that much more aware that we have to keep that, that information communication superhighway running smoothly because people will be more than happy to share all of the roadblocks and detours that we threw up. And of Absolutely. Course, and, you know, and, and like anything, though, know, I mean, there's always going to be, I don't care where you go, who you are, you can be the most amazing human being, and there is always going to be people that are going to attempt to tear you down. And, and you know, those are the types of things you just have to go with the flow on. It, it is social media, like anything, there's always going to be people out there that are riffraffed, and that's just the way it is. And, you know, you can't, you, you can't be fighting everything. I mean, that's just life. <laughs> You know yeah, what I mean? You, you could be. It's it's kind of like the old saying, "Fighting the current." I don't choose to fight the current. I choose to go with the current. I mean, you know that that that's life. There's always going to be something out there. And you know, you know as you know, whenever you're succeeding and you're rising up to the top, there's always going to be people that are attempt going to attempt to tear you down. That doesn't mean you you don't you don't you don't succumb to allow people to tear you down. At the same time, you don't sit there and go, okay, well this person said this person, this person said this, you know what I mean? That's just kind of... Yeah, you know. it, it's, totally tr it's totally true. But one of the things that I think is interesting is that people are so defensive now that oftentimes the biggest problem that I have in training customer service people is to put their ego away. Nine times out of ten, when somebody has a customer service problem to the point where it escalates into an argument or it escalates into a complaint to me as their manager, it is because they took and got defensive at something the customer said or did and started to get snippy or started to get argumentative or confrontative and most of the time and that's one of the things I really was hoping came out in the blog is that as soon as I heard my girl get defensive I knew it was going to get ugly from there 
And, and so I think that one of the things we have to realize is that you said it already. We don't even know where they've come from. We don't even know what's going on in their lives. And so we have to realize we can't really worry so much about what they think about us because chances are they're not. I mean, Carly, yesterday, my very first customer, I said, hey, Joni, how are you doing? You know, I just got up. I just got to work. I'm wild. I'm full of energy. And I said, hey, Joan, how are you doing? And Joan looked at me and she said, I was just diagnosed with ovarian cancer and I can't even see a doctor for a week. Mm. Yeah, and it, it's, it's things like that you just go, you know, it's life. I mean, like you said in, in, the, in the blog post, there's always going to be twists, turns, hills, you know, it's life. You, what are you going to do? You know, I'm going for surgery on Monday. What are you going to do? You just going to crawl in a hole and and never come out? And, and you know, it's I don't. It's like you know, I don't post on Facebook. And go, oh my God! You know, it's like I'm not looking for the sorries. I'm so sorry. You know, I don't want to hear. I'm so sorry. It's like it's another day. You know, I'm still going to get up. I'm I'm actually still coaching clients a week when I get home from surgery. Next week, I'm still coaching my clients verbally. I'm not doing a lot of my other stuff. However, I'm still doing all my, my, my actually, my verbal coaching clients. You know, I'm not doing my consulting where I'm leaving the house, but I'm still going to be doing what you and I are doing. I'll still be doing some Google converse, you know, conversations. I'll still be doing coaching conversations on the, uh, via Skype or with my cell phone. But, you know, it's like you don't, you don't crawl in a hole and just, well, I mean, you have the choice to do that. I, this one of the things I actually love is one of the phrases I actually love is victim or victor. I choose victor. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I sure. to be a victim and wallow in things and just wallow, wallow, wallow and, and play that. I I don't understand that. Life is always going to throw you a curveball, and you have the choice to succumb to something or not. And I'm and I'm sure you know she was sad, and I'm sure and I'm sure she's a really strong person. She'll do what she has to do, and it, it does. It does, unfortunately, with the medical community and the medical systems. It really, it really does bite. Unfortunately, I'm going to use that word when you have to wait a week to see a doctor when you get hit with something like that. It's like, oh, by the way, you have this. Now, uh, sorry, you can't see anyone for a week. That type of thing is really, really hard, and you have to sit on it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, and that's where a support system comes in hand. Having someone that you can talk to. Rallying the friends around, rallying the troops around. You know who who do you have to surround yourself with? Friends, family. You know, you. I'm sure was was willing to listen. I know you. I know you didn't just go uh, next. I know you sat there and listened to her, and well, I know, you know you gave her a nice pep talk too. Well, you know what? One of the things that 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 I did is, of course, I changed gears because where I was where I was really going with that is that I didn't even see that coming. And so you're making assumptions and you have no clue as to what's going on. But I did write a post um, about cancer about a week and a half ago, and so I reposted it again today in her honor. Um, but what I told her is very simply this. There's three things that you can do when you have a really big wallow in your life, and the first of which is that you can determine that you are going to fight like hell. And it's so important that you do that because you don't want your family members standing around going, oh, what if mom would have just tried? What if mom wouldn't have just given up? What if mom would have really went for it? The second thing you do, and you mentioned it, is that you need to rally the troops around you. You need to lead your friends. Because the thing is that a lot of times when people don't know what to do, they opt to do nothing. So when people don't know what to do about a diagnosis that you have or a major setback that you have, a lot of times they just won't do anything. And so a lot of people interpret that as no one cares and they give up. So I told her, and I tell all of my customers this, is to go ahead and rally your friends. Lead them into just what you said, hey, life's going to go on. I'm going to be okay, but I need your help right now. And the third thing is you look at the opportunity you've been given. The most incredible learning experience I ever had 20 years ago when I was first working in community pharmacy, one of my customers had ALS. His name was Vernon, and I'll never forget it. He got Lou Gehrig's disease, and he chose to alienate every single person that he knew to the point where his wife looked at me, and I'll never forget it as long as I live, and she said, Corey, he said to me, 
why can't this be you instead of me? Oh so my was, God. Yeah, he was given this opportunity to mend all of the fences, to connect with all of the people that you know whose connections were frayed, and he chose to be so angry with God that essentially his family was happy when he was finally gone. So one of the things that we need to do is embrace those opportunities that life says, hey, guess what? You forgot to be thankful for what you had when you had it. Now you've got a chance. What are you going to do with that chance? I said, nothing's changed at all, Joni. I said, nothing's changed. Nothing's any different than it was yesterday. You've always known the end is coming, but now it's a little larger. So what are you going to do? And I told her, you know, this week what you need to do is get your friends around you, do something that you really enjoy, but God, for whatever it's worth, do not wallow in self-pity because then that makes you feel like a victim. And if you turn into a victim to cancer, you will be done. And I think that cancer is big in our, our society, but it's not the only setback that we can have. And I, but I do think that it's symbolic of the mindset that we need to have and that we're going to fight, we're going to lead our friends, and we're going to take the opportunity to enjoy the people in our lives while we have them. I knew, I knew Corey would give her an amazing pep talk. Well, that's, that's something that, you know, I, I want to make clear is that the reason that I'm able to do that is because I've learned over the last 25 years working with the public from people who've taught me. As I said, the customer who probably taught me the most was the guy that took the opportunity to alienate everybody he, he knew because he was angry. Well, I I can I can attest to that. I mean, I you know, as you know, I've had a, a, a yes. Yeah. There was a time when I was very angry when I was going through all my different procedures, and I I did the same thing. I alienated, and it, it you know you can only alienate for so long, and you can only play the angry person for so long, and eventually you realize really quick if you have two choices, and you know, and being being the person that where you just alienate and you wallow in it, you know, you just become a very angry, isolated, um, and you actually just get sicker. And eventually, when you go, when you, you know, as you know, you, doing the same thing over and over again, uh, is, to me anyway, is a definition of insanity. And when you, get, when you actually get so sick of, sick and tired of being sick and tired of, you know, it, you know, you will eventually really choose. And it wasn't until I actually, you know, really did seriously make the choice to live, literally live, that I did I finally really change. And and it was it was a tough road, and and, it, and I had to make that choice. And it really does boil down to that. When people have cancer, or any sort of terminal illness, or or any sort of chronic recurrent illness, it really boils down to one day choosing to live or die. That's really what it boils down to. Because eventually, when you when you have something that's really tough, like cancer or anything that's really bad, you just you're so tired and you're so you're in so much pain and blah blah blah. You know, you you just want to give up. You just want to go. Please, just take me. And eventually, you're gonna have to make a choice. You're gonna have to want to choose life or not. And it, it really boils down to that. And when you finally choose one or the other, then you're gonna choose to either you know rise above it and choose a positive attitude and choose to be something different. And when you well, make you know, that choice, life changes. I don't know that, that you and I have ever talked about this, but the reason that I became public with book writing and blog writing and personal development and so forth is that there was a few time in my life a few years ago when I was extremely anxious and I was extremely stressed out because I had told myself this story about what a tough life I had. I had a life that most people would kill for. And I, I, I felt that I was beaten up. I felt like I was stressed out. And, and, and I just really didn't want to live anymore. I didn't want to go out and kill myself. I just didn't want to live anymore. And all of a sudden, I, I became the luckiest person in the history of the world because all of a sudden the thought popped into my head, hey, do you really want your 8-year-old to grow up without a father? And it was weird because I, I came home that night and I checked my computer and there was an email from my friend who I had emailed him and I said, what if I lost everything? You know, I was so anxious that I was afraid of losing everything. I said, what if I lost everything? And he said, you can't lose everything because you'll always have me. 
And then I walked into my kitchen, and there was a coffee cup sitting on the counter, and I looked at it, and it all of a sudden hit me. I said, you know, it's just an effing cup. I said that out loud. No one's around, and I said that out loud. And I started looking at all the things we cling to, all the things we hang on to that are worth nothing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing. And all of a sudden, in one lightning bolt moment, I realized, yeah, you can let yourself decide to be miserable in the face of happiness, or you can be happy in the face of misery, but it's entirely up to me. And it's this choice to stop telling ourselves these lousy stories about, oh, woe is me, when all you have to do is look around and there's somebody worse off than you. But I, wanted, I, wanted, Go ahead. I just wanted to share something that, that happened to me one, one night. Tanya used to take me to a lot of these uh, church home groups, you know, where, like, say, three, four couples get together and they discuss the Bible and so forth. And it was really funny one night because there's always somebody who wants to take every Bible verse and turn it into a story about them. Well, this one night there was this woman who I'd never seen before, and she kept doing that, and I was getting so annoyed. And, and she just kept taking the story back to her. And then all of a sudden, the topic of, like, cancer or serious illness came up, and she said the most brilliant thing I'd ever heard any person say. She said, people are always saying, why me? Why me? And you know what? Why not you? What is it that makes you exempt from the hardships of life? What is it that, thinks that, that makes you think that God's going to give you a free pass? And I was like, wow. I never saw that coming, and I never saw it coming out of her. So if you realize how many times that we could just choose to be happier than we are, we could be so happy if we just choose to be in the moment realizing the gifts that we've been given because we've all been given them. It's just that oftentimes we tell our stories about how we've been given less than other people and so forth. Absolutely agree. And as usual, you and I could talk forever and ever and ever. And I just want everyone to know there is always someone somewhere who has it worse than you do. So for tonight, Corey and I are going to have to leave everybody because Corey and I literally could talk forever. And it has been a long time since Corey and I have done a podcast and video together. So it is going to be tonight. It's going to be good night. However, we will be seeing you again and um, I just, I'm just really happy. I'm just really, I mean, it's been so long, Corey. So it's just been really brilliant tonight. And I really look forward to having another brilliant conversation with you sooner than later this time. <laughs> so anyways, thank you so much for joining me. And I just love bringing you valuable content, everybody. So thank you so much for listening in and tuning in. And I wish everyone a wonderful night. And so I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Have a great night, everybody. And uh, Corey, you, please let everyone know where they can reach you because it is a podcast, not just a video. Well, well right now the best place to reach me is at www.simplymonkeys.com. S-I-M-P-L-Y-M-O-N-K-E-Y-S.com. And you've been with your host, Carly Alyssa Thorne, and you can reach me at CarlyAlyssaThorne.com. And as usual, I put together a page that's got the embedded podcast and the embedded video, and they'll have links to everything you could possibly imagine that you can find Coria and me. So have a great night, everyone.